Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. My guest tonight is probably South Africa's most famous teacher. He began his career as an educationist studying uh, uh, Zimbabwean education, uh, got a PhD in the United States. He worked as a, in an education faculty at uh, the University of South Africa. And um, then he resigned to become a headmaster because he wanted to prove that you could take poor, te poor schools and make them better. Professor Janssen, Professor Jonathan Janssen, uh, is, is the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Free State. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, you are, you've been a Vice Chancellor a very tumultuous time in universities, mm. and you've decided to resign after seven years. Mm -hmm. I know you said you would. Uh, but what is the core problem of our universities? Our core problem is the, that for almost 15 years you've had a systematic underfunding of public higher education at the same time as universities were supposed to do more and more uh, in terms of the delivery of education. So, so you've got a lot more students now. Double, more double, the, double students, the students since the But not double the budget but a gradual decrease in the budget. And of course, those two planes eventually collided, as you know. That led to the uh, disruptions and the protests of the past 18 months. Now, why did that happen? It seems curious, because one of the things I noticed is South Africa is producing black PhDs, some in South Africa and some overseas. But when they come back or when they complete, they don't go into the university. Some go into business, but some even go into government, because mm. government pays them better than academia. And they might be better suited to academia anyway. And yet our priorities seem to be skewed. Well, it makes sense, actually. If you were a first-generation PhD from a black family uh, uh, and you wanted to, and you had the obligation to help an extended family, there is no way you're going to university unless uh, you're a fool like myself and you love the life of the mind and you love... Uh, but why do why? Doesn't the government see it that way? What about the Minister of Higher Education? Well, you know, uh, government uh, doesn't uh, think uh, very much about anything. And it's the last thing it thinks about is the salaries of academics. So from time to time, there would be, you know, uh, acknowledgement that uh, you need to, to, as in the past, by the way, uh, peg uh, salaries of academics at the same level as you do the civil service. But that's never happened and it's not going to happen. What about under, I mean, President Zuma is not uh, uh, someone who, who seems to spend a lot of time caring about the universities, but what about President Abeki, who we all thought of as a great intellectual? Did he focus on this problem? No, nobody's ever focused on this problem, you know, uh, before or after 1994. So, so nobody really, everybody makes the demand that you need more black professors, that you need more, you know, uh, 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 advancement of black scholarship, et cetera, et cetera, transformation. Transformation, but you can't do that without money. And what do the government say when you tell them that? Um, we are tending to that, comrade. <laughs> no, people, look, I mean, people know it's a serious issue, you know, but where's the money going to come from? The priority right now is to make sure that you have enough money to keep as many young people as possible in university without the burden of debt that follows, and that's the priority. But doesn't it mean from a national, we'll come to the universities uh, specifically a little bit more, but doesn't it mean in terms of national priorities that you have to say that the public service salaries, which have grown enormously since I was in government in the 90s, uh, that that's gone too far in relation to the professors, for instance. You know, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't just look at the public. I'd look at the entire public sector spending bill and say, are our priorities in the right place? Shouldn't we privatise, you know, SAA? Shouldn't we spend less money on, uh, on the public sector? Shouldn't we reduce the size of the cabinet? I mean, take your pick, you know. Whatever you wish to do, we're not putting the money in places that matter. There's so many wasteful uh, yeah. uh, examples of wasteful sp spending. The historian Professor uh, Charles von Onsenen has written that there are two separate problems in the universities, perhaps more. Education is the one which you've touched on, but also that the social problem, that there are students who are hungry. And if you're hungry and you get a scholarship, you obviously support your family and you're still hungry. 
Is that how you see it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Charles is right. I mean, the, you know, there's no way you can support a student in South Africa only with money for tuition and accommodation, for example. You have to take care of a whole lot of inherited you know, uh, kinds of burdens, uh, one of which is just uh, uh, abject poverty. How will I feed myself? Uh, whatever I get, and by the way, this was also true when I was a student, you know, the little bit that you had, you shared with the, with the family. family. It's even worse now, I think, in terms of, you know, degrees of poverty. Because there are such extremes. There are such extremes. Now, uh, uh, inside the university, it, it also leads, as far as I understand it, among students, you really, there's a, a division among black students between elite students and poor students. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does that dynamic play out? Well, it depends which universities you're talking about. So if you're talking about a university like Limpopo or the University of Fort Hare, everybody's poor, you know, and so you don't see those go. When you're talking about uh, the university middle, of Cape upper, Town like or UCT, Free State. well, not Free State so much. We have a much, you know, there's less inequality there. Uh -huh. It's still there, but not as much. But it's dramatic at a place like UCT, for example, or Stellenbosch, you know, where you can clearly see that even the black students who come in are kids who went to bishops and and Rondebosch boys and so on, so they come from really good public and private uh, schools. But does that lead to, to a certain guilt or a, a certain need to, to identify with the poorest students? There's certainly a guilt factor. That's one of many factors that lead middle class students to revolt. You know, it's, 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 it's a sense of how am I doing so well when I can see right next to me there is such poverty. And for me it was just the luck of the draw that my father or mother was uh, uh, got 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 some kind of deal or got, got lucky. Done. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean none of us, you know, can claim that the only reason that we're doing that in terms of relative privilege that this is because of you. It's really because of a set of things set that of you were lucky to be part of. of. Your yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, um, I think we'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll be talking to Jonathan Janssen. We're back with Professor John, Jonathan Janssen. Jonathan, why are you leaving? Um, you know, I've got this thing about seven years, and uh, since the day I took the job at the University of the Free State, I said to my bosses, um, seven years, five years, first contract, plus two. If I can't make a you know, marked difference in the university, then I'm not doing my job. Uh, there will always be things to do, as you can imagine. Uh, in a university that's essentially old. Uh, but I think I've done what I could. Uh, there have been massive changes in the university across a number of uh, areas. And I'm happy with where we are, but obviously conscious of where we still need to be and go. But I'm happy to leave. But if, if that's the case, surely, I mean, I've been to events where people say you should be president of South Africa. People have praised you a lot. Uh, there's no doubt within education you have a great contribution to make. Isn't there something else you could do here? No, I'm, I'm doing on fellowship for one year and then I'll be back. Uh, you know, uh, my conscience won't allow me to leave uh, as in permanently. So, but I do need the time to re-energize um, my own academic work. I have uh, two or three research projects underway. Uh, I've got a few books I need to complete and so on. So that is important to me. You know, I'm not a natural manager. I'm told I do a reasonable job, but I'm not a natural manager. I am at heart a professor. I get an enormous kick out of thinking and the reading and the writing and the researching. So I'm going to do that and nothing else for a year, and that should get me back up to speed. The, obviously, the, the job of the University of Free State was a massive task. Mm. Uh, it, it was perhaps one of our most old-fashioned universities, and uh, uh, you set out with an uh, intention to transform it mm. in terms of ac academic modernizing as well as mm. uh, racial change. Um, what's it been like? It's been a lot of fun. I, uh, first of all, I have an enormously uh, uh, competent team. Uh, competent in a broad sense, you know, both politically competent as well as uh, technically competent. So the combination of those skills of seven senior people around me uh, ha 
it's made this a really interesting job. They also freed me up to do what for me was really important, which is representing the university in the broader communities at home and abroad, raising money for the universities all over the place, uh, and making sure that I could spend quality time with students. I don't think there's another university in the world where the leadership, plural, spends more time with its students in, uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in my home, you know, in my office, uh, on the sports field, um, uh, in the religious uh, community. But you're making it yeah. sound a lot more peaceful than yeah. we think it, than I think it was. I, I saw an article about you in uh, um, in one of the magazines saying that uh, it was it, indicating it was very tough. Not really. I mean, remember I've had seven years. You know, if you look at the, the range of the seven years, I went to bed and slept peacefully every night. The past eighteen months was tough and one week in particular around the, uh, the Rugby Park incident. I mean, that was horrible, that was horrific. That was also unexpected. And what, then, was, what was that? What happened there was that a group of uh, students and workers, a small group, uh, uh, interrupted a rugby match in progress. And then some of the spectators, which included some of our students, but also a lot of people from outside, attacked the protesters and what happened is then uh, quite a number of the students felt really aggrieved by that understandably and then started to you know spread out across campus attacked some of our uh, buildings and, and statues and what have you and that was horrible so for a week you know I've interviewed uh, busy interviewing 10 vice chancellors who went through similar kinds of things when I compare what they went through to that one week of horror I mean it's not comparable. So overall, if I look at the seven years and even the past 18 months, you know, we were quiet before and after that week, you know, relatively quiet. We haven't had the kind of, uh, I certainly haven't had the kind of stresses that my fellow... But in the pieces, article, I think it was in Nose Week, yeah. I got the impression that you'd had, uh, you and your family had had quite a rough time. It, it's, look, it's, it's, it's always rough. I mean, if you're going to run a university in, in, in post-apartheid South Africa, you better believe it's going to be rough, you know. So most of the rough comes from the right wing, the white right, okay. Uh, and it's different media. And um, is that old establishment in Bloemfontein that has never in accepted? The free, in the free state, but also in parts of the country, you know. Alumni. That have never accepted that, 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 that the kind of change you're talking about. But, and not just on the campus, but in the country. So their grievance with me as a person or with the, you know, the family or whatever is a grievance with the country, you know. But that was part of the cause. I mean, you sort of expect that to happen. I don't take most of that seriously unless, you know. But there are black students who've also been angry and have felt that you weren't taking their side. Well, I, I think if you looked at our campus of 32,000 students and you ask who those black students were, it's a handful of students. Um, it tends to also be students with whom I meet regularly in which you won't believe the kind of rapport that we have. It's yes. when you know, the politics takes over and the outside influences come in and the need to perform, you know, uh, takes on, then you sort of say, but wait a minute, I just sat with you in my office and we had a cup of coffee, what is this, you know? So I've understood those uh, kinds of performances as well as being a public... Uh, what are those outside influences? Is it, is it political parties? First of all, there's political parties that heavily sponsor some of these. By the way, on the right and the left, so this is not just you know, one-sided, and, and that's true for all our universities, by the way. Now, this, there seems to be a sort of a pincer movement, which you, you've implied. There's pressure from the students uh, 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 to end outsourcing, mm -hmm. to increase financial support. And there's pressure from the right, as you say. Um, but you've been quite negative about the future of our universities. Yeah. No, no, we're going, we're in trouble. Anybody that tells you there's a good outcome to what we've seen over the past 18 months is lying, okay? I'm a student of African universities in the post-independence period. So I can tell you now, the factors that brought down the universities of Dar es Salaam, Makerere, Zimbabwe, and made them nothing, made them less than teacher colleges, in terms of their academic standing are the same factors now impacting on South African universities. And, and, and those three factors are, as you know, underfunding by the governments, state interference, and chronic instability. You take those three things together, you don't have a future. Just before we take a break, is there anyone in government who understands that problem? Yeah. 
What are they doing about it? Nothing. Why? Because I think their priorities are elsewhere. I mean, right now, the leadership in our government, their priorities include self-preservation. It doesn't include the public sector, you know? It doesn't include, I mean, I haven't sat down with senior people in government, you know, uh, uh, since I've been a vice chancellor, where they engage you individually and say, what do you think we can do? What is it that we don't, you know, nothing. Um, yeah, I'm afraid we have to break. We'll be back in a moment. And we're back with Professor Janssen. You've given quite a pessimistic scenario. Where do you see South African universities in the next 10 years? I think the next 10 to 15 years, you will see that the top 10 universities will begin to resemble the bottom 10. And that's bad for higher education in South Africa. I, I just don't see a way out of this. First of all, the economy is not growing, as you know, less than 0.5%. I mean, that in and of itself tells you there's no money uh, in the kitty. I don't see a leadership on the part of government that says we've got to rescue our universities and make sure that this public asset that gives us high-level skills uh, and leadership, you know, is protected. I don't see any of that awareness. And, um, and, and what I do see is the very opposite behavior, which is let's take more and more control of these places of higher learning, which of course is gonna be a disaster. So um, uh, the future doesn't look bright. The one thing that distinguished South Africa from many other African universities is we had, uh, you know, within our uh, borders, some of the best universities in the world. That's no longer gonna be the case. That's, that's disturbing. But as we, 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 we hinted earlier on, there is a solution, and the solution would be a reallocation of resources from some of the overspending or wasteful spending in government. Well, you need two things. You need, first of all, the issue of resources, but you also need the issue of leadership. You see, you need a leadership that understands your schools are important, your universities are important. These are the primary uh, assets for rebuilding democracy and rebuilding, for sustaining democracy and rebuilding the economy. If you don't understand that, at, at the heart of the government, and our government doesn't, Julius Nairere understood that. Robert Mugabe, despite the political you know, flaws of the man and moral flaws, he understood that. That's why they have one of the best school systems in the world, despite, we don't understand that. But, but, but the, what's happened to Zimbabwe universities? Yeah, no, in terms of the universities, I mean, there was an open encroachment by the state on those universities and they destroyed them, okay? But in terms of the school system, Zimbabwe did not destroy the school system. But you're using a strong word, word destroy. You're mm -hmm. saying that, that African universities, that many African universities were destroyed. Mm -hmm. Are you saying Nerere did not? No, what I'm saying, Nerere understood the importance of education uh, in the life of uh, its democracy and its development and so on and so forth, you know, and, and he put a lot of resources, a lot of energy into it and so on. He got overtaken, okay, in a mm -hmm. very poor East African country right. by global developments and global economic uh, pressures and so on. We still have room to maneuver. You know, we're not a, a uh, failed state. But you are saying uh, it's we, an emergency, really. Uh, but what we don't have is if Julius Nareda was in this situation now, we could have a very different outcome than we, we seem to be headed for. Right. Well, this leads to the wider question. Um, what, have you, what you've suggested uh, about government management is a wider crisis. What could turn the country around? I think what, what could turn this country around is a change of government. I don't mean necessarily a change of political party, but a change of government. That is the kind of... Lead I mean, just look at our, our cabinet at the moment. I mean, this is the core of the leadership that must change the country, okay? There isn't a sense of moral responsibility for the behavior of fellow leaders. We've seen that. There isn't a sense of our responsibility on the world stage. If you just look at our voting on the United Nations and LGBTI issues, if you just look at how we defend ourselves in, in the Al Jazeera case, if you just look at the behavior of our political parties in the parliamentary, uh, uh, circus. So, you know, <laughs> unless you have a leadership that you can have all the resources in the world, 
if you look at a country like Libya, for example, you can have enormous resources, but if you don't have a leadership that takes those resources and makes it work for people, primarily through restoring uh, your institutions, your schools and your universities are, of course, the things I'm concerned about. If you don't have that, you can have all the money in the world. If you have leadership, and you don't have any money to begin with. So you need those two things to act in concert in the interest. I mean, if, if we could just get public servants understand the meaning of those two words. Is there a role for ordinary people? I mean, I think back to the days of the United Democratic Front in the yeah. 80s. I mean, I don't think uh, that kind of UDF would work now, but mm -hmm. is there a role for, for civil society and what can ordinary people do? Well, I think first of all, people should use their vote, okay? Um, uh, as you know, m most of my generation got to vote in their 30s and 40s. You know, they didn't vote from the beginning. You've got to use your vote to indicate what kind of leadership uh, you want in place. If you don't vote, or if you vote in a way that's irresponsible, and you return to power the very same people that keep us locked in the situation, then of course, uh, you know, we deserve what we get. The second thing is, ordinary people must make their voices heard without fear or favor. The problem is people here are easily intimidated. I mean, if you just look at the run-up to these elections, these municipal elections, and look at the number of people who've already died, okay, in, in factional fighting uh, around the country. So the stakes are very high, but unless we take seriously our role as public uh, actors, as you know, we are going to be stuck in the same situation. We, we, we're running low on time, but I do want to just get into quick questions. The one is uh, following on that. Uh, what about, you know, in the 80s we had church leaders, we had a depth of leadership in, in a number of spheres. Are the churches, the, the faith-based institutions, the other institutions, are they serving us satisfactorily? Yeah, but in an episodic way. So, you know, every now and again the church would make a statement or write an open letter. You can't just do that once, you know. You've got to take to the streets, you've got to hammer on the doors, you've got to insist on different kinds of outcomes. But you can't wake up and every third Saturday decide it's time to make your voice heard. So you need a concerted effort, whether it's the SABC, uh, you know, or whether it is, uh, you know, ESCOM or whether it is uh, the public schools. You need citizens to get behind movements like equal education, et cetera, et cetera, on a public sustained mass basis. Otherwise, you get, you, you, you know, what you deserve. Last question. Has anyone in government asked you to reconsider? Did, did, the, I, uh, did the president send his plane to Bloemfontein to bring you back to ask you to do something else in government? Is there something that you could be asked to do in South African education that would change your mind about leaving the country for the next year? Well, no, no plane has landed <laughs> that I'm aware of. No, no, look, there is a certain kind of uh, political... Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I know people take seriously the work that we do, and people would privately, uh, as you know, uh, you know, uh, thank you for what you do. Yes. But I, I, there, there's also this this uh, pretense, this need to seem in control, and to not go to the very people, and not me. Take me out of the picture. I mean, there's a whole lot of people in South Africa. that can, in South Africa, ordinary citizens that if government who have skills that if government was humble enough, yeah. and said, you know what. We need you to help turn. We might not like you, but we need you to help turn around. We can change this country over the weekend. Yeah. On that more optimistic note, we have to end, end uh, this interview. Uh, before we go, I'm recommending a book. This is a self-published book by a former uh, a, a commander of Umkonto Wissis with the ANC military. He's Stanley Manong, and the book is If We Must Die. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a nice book. It's worth reading. He's a very... I've met him. He's a very responsible, thoughtful man. He gives the ANC credit every place it's due, and he doesn't criticize unduly, but he does give a re more realistic look at our history. For example, he talks about the period in which Robert Mugabe humiliated Oliver Tambo as, as leader of the ANC in the 80s, uh, which, which corrects some of the more recent views that we've had, which imply that Mugabe was always uh, part of the South African liber liberation. Uh, he wasn't. But anyway, that's, that's all we have time to. My thanks to Jonathan Janssen. Uh, goodbye and happy reading.